recently come to light that we are now living in a more peaceful world. This counterintuitive claim comes in two recently published books. One is by Steven Pinker, and it is called The Better Angels of Our Nature. The mic is Why Violence Has Declined. The other is by Joshua Goldstein. And it is entitled, Winning the War on War, The Decline of Armed Con Conflict Worldwide. Both of these fine books argue that violence, as the subtitle suggests, is on the decline, and that our world is becoming more peaceful. On the face of it, and the assumption in both books is, understandably, that this is a good thing. I think it's possible, I think it's possible to divide people who study things like conflict and conflict resolution into two groups. We'll call them realists and believers. Realists argue that fundamentally the world has not changed over the millennium. When it comes to issues of life and death, people behave in essentially the same way that they did 100 or 1,000 years ago. If I shout fire in a crowded room, most people will rush for the door, and as, and as has, happen, has happened often in overcrowded nightclubs where there's one exit, people die in the stampede. This unfortunate set of events continues to repeat itself, and we appear to be unable to change this element of human nature. <coughs> In similar ways, realists assume that conflict is inevitable. There will always be somebody who is willing to do you harm or to prioritize their interests over yours. Believers, of course, see things differently. For them, that the world has changed is self-evident. It is never easy, and it may be slow, but the world is always getting better. Civilization evolves. We no longer practice slavery or engage in dueling. Fewer parents today resort to corporal punishment than in their parents' generation. From this perspective, there is certainly nothing that is inevitable about violence or conflict. Through a combination of reasoning, <coughs> understanding, and technology, we are able to solve or resolve most of our problems or conflicts. If we see Steven Pinker and Joshua Goldstein as two of my believers, how would a realist respond to the thesis of their books? What would a realist say about the prospect of a more peaceful world? What would be the, the consequences of declining violence? What would be the upshot of a world where peace is prioritized above all else? Was conflict always a destructive process. In an effort to answer these questions, let me make three points. My first comment is to point out that there are a number of factors which contribute to a more peaceful society. But undoubtedly, one of the most important of these is the idea of a state. In, mo in the most familiar definition, the state is said to be the entity that has a monopoly on force over power or, or power over just about everything else in its territory. The state is also the rules, <laughs> the institutions, the bureaucracy in a given country. States allow large populations to live together. If not for states, sometimes argue it is unlikely we could live uh, 
with anything like the present numbers of people that inhabit the world today. Furthermore, it's pointed out that in places like Somalia, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, or Afghanistan, those countries have had terrible problems with violence because they have no state or else a very weak state. Countries like Canada, or the United States, or those countries in Western Europe, by contrast, are peaceful because they have a state, a state that is strong. According to the sociologist of the late Charles Tilley, people in the West are much less likely to die at the hands of somebody else than ever before because they live in strong states. We may think we are more peaceful by nature, say the realists, when in fact the state is responsible for the peace that we enjoy. No. I the problem is, State creation is hard to do. Okay, yeah, I think so. And historically, it has involved a kind of Faustian bargain. In order to get peace, it has often involved the pacification of hundreds of internal rebellions and warlords, or those who simply resist being ruled by someone else or someone they do not like. And that requires force or some kind of coercive means. As the American author and narrator David McCullough has stated, between 1861 and 1865, Americans made war on each other and killed each other in great numbers, if only to become the kind of country that could no longer conceive how that was possible. From this perspective, the peace that we enjoy in the West today is a consequence of the violence that was carried out yesterday. Although this history is remembered selectively or not at all when it comes to Western policies towards developing countries. When groups such as Amnesty International call for peaceful conduct by contemporary governments in Africa or Asia or the Middle East, they may be doing the right thing from an immediate and moral perspective but it would be fair to wonder if heeding their advice will ever lead to the same kind of state we find in the West today. A more peaceful world may mean that Western states remain calm, whereas, for lack of a state, many developing countries will remain in a condition of unending anarchy. Relatedly, and this is my second point, there is also a case to be made that war and conflict has been an important source of development. For some, the measures that you take in response to the threat from abroad is the political equivalent of you going to the gym to train for the big fight you're going to have with me next Saturday night. Among other things, the threat of war forces countries to raise an army, which in turn forces governments to raise taxes to pay for that army. The bureaucracy needed to extract those taxes is, from this perspective, the beginnings of a state. Africa has not had many interstate wars. A remarkable achievement, to be sure, except that it has led some to see it as an explanation for its sometimes stalled development. According to the American political scientist Jeffrey Hurst, the lack of external threats to countries in Africa has also meant that there is a lack of internal development. In short, no war equals no development. Of course, Africa has had many wars, but these are civil wars, that is, internal wars, and are a consequence of a weak state being overwhelmed by a multitude of rebel, of rebel movements that inhabit their unchanging political territories. <coughs> Since 
African governments generally do not invade other African countries, the realist argument goes. This development process has never begun. It is, again, a fair question to ask if developments will proceed in places like Africa in the absence of war. Finally, my third point is to question the idea that a more peaceful world is necessarily a happier or a more just place. Peace, in the negative sense, may be more indicative of sterility or one side's ability to suppress others. You have enemies, Winston Churchill once said, good. It means for once in your life, you stood up for something. Realists believe that there will always be people who are willing to exploit those who are afraid to stand up for something. Sure, peace can always be achieved, provided one side is willing to get up, give up the things that they believe in. To refuse to stand up to those ideals may mean peace, but it also may mean that you are being dominated by someone else's agenda, or that you will always settle for something that is less than optimal. Nelson Mandela refused to forego violence because of his belief that armed struggle served a more noble purpose, which was to end apartheid in South Africa. The American Civil War was fought because, among other things, people, often the women, objected to slavery against the better judgment of her husband, the American Secretary of State, and recognizing the immense sacrifice in human life the Civil War would inevitably entail, Francis Seward wrote that no compromise will be made with slavery of black or white. And during the awful civil war in Liberia, women took advantage of their unique place in society to upend and sweep away the old male-dominated order and, among other things, place a woman in the presidential palace. A place where there is no conflict means that people are indifferent or perhaps unwilling to defend their values. <clears throat> the United Nations loses its value if it becomes a forum that prioritizes decorum over debate. It means that no one is prepared to stand up to the Rwandan ambassador. <coughs> the UN in 1994 and tell him that the genocidal actions of his government are unacceptable. The UN might appear to be a more peaceful place, points out the American political commentator Robert Kaplan, but that is because its members too often allow the public formalities of diplomacy to obscure the important differences of opinion about how we should organize ourselves. These debates and differences are not about nothing. They are a reflection of the deep divides on how to deal with real problems. They cannot be subverted for the sake of peace. Let's be clear. Violence, violent conflict, is terrible. I don't mean to minimize the untold hardship or misery <coughs> conflict brings, or to see conflict as the only or even the most important force of social change. But to a degree unmatched by almost any other social process, conflict has also produced things that we value. We should not pretend that conflict is avoidable in a world, uh, or that a world uh, without it is a world without problems. Nor should we overlook the progressive elements of what the late economist Joseph Schumpeter referred to as creative destruction. In his sense, just as the laptop destroyed the typewriter, there can be progressive elements of conflict. 
Realists may not focus on the progressive elements of conflict, saying instead that the world is characterized more by its continuities than its changes. But such creative elements are clearly there. Believers, on the other hand, may seek to avoid violence and conflict, but their embrace of technology and change makes conflict and progress inevitable. Thanks very much. <laughs>